Come on now. That's the uh, obvious hard-hitting first question. Why Secretary of State? Yeah, I've got a passion about elections. Uh, it's one of the first things that I started working on when I arrived in the Senate. In fact, uh, as a brand new legislator in 2011, uh, at the time, the Secretary of State came to me because I was the only veteran in the Senate and asked me to help with the House bill that he was working on to make it easier for overseas military personnel. Got me started on this journey. I've always had an interest in the redistricting issue as well and worked a lot on that. And as I've built this reputation, as you know, sort of in the term limited state legislature, you don't get a lot of time to build an area of expertise. And once you latch onto something, people start coming to you with it. So really most, almost all of the, of the legislation that pertains to elections issues over the last seven years has either been something I've written or worked very personally on. And so I've had my hands in, in the elections issues. Mark knows this covering us day to day over there. And uh, it ties in with something from my past too. And this is something that, that it's, it's right here for me. And I've, as I've been out there, it's funny when you, when you go out on the road and you do these uh, speaking engagements, these stump speeches, it actually is a, a, it's kind of a self examination process, right? Because I feel like I don't want to give the same stump speech every night. So I'm always trying to think through it as I walk in there saying something different. And as I really try to boil it down into one or two minutes to explain to people, one of the reasons I'm passionate about elections is because I've been to places where people don't have the right to vote. And I've also been to places where I saw people vote for the first time, places like Kosovo uh, and Iraq when I was in the military. And those experiences stick with you. When I was in Southern Iraq, for example, they had their first national election, their parliamentary election. And I was there right after that as they were counting the ballots. Well, the there were posters out, there were, um, propaganda messages that had gone out from the Al-Qaeda element that, as our president would say, these are bad hombres, right? These are people that would do violence and, and do do violence. Uh, they were saying they would cut off your finger if they saw the purple ink on it. Purple ink indicated that you'd voted. These people were saying it was un-Islamic to vote, and if they saw purple ink on your finger, they'd cut it off. Of course, there's nothing un-Islamic about voting. That's nonsense. But uh, despite threats of physical violence, uh, credible threats, they had 70% voter turnout, over 70%. And remember, this was not vote from the comfort of home via mail. This was not show up at a convenient neighborhood polling location. This was stand out in, in the Iraqi sun, uh, maybe walk four or five miles from your village to the next village. This was an arduous experience with death threats and threats of, of physical violence associated and 70% of the people showed up. It says something about the human nature, about, about the human spirit that, that people want to be a part of their democracy and we have this mechanism called elections that does that and we take it for granted but that power to use ballots instead of bullets to overthrow your government because that's what you basically do in an election you have the power to peacefully overthrow your government uh, with with ballots instead of bullets and um, that to me is inspiring and it's rare in human history throughout thousands of years that humans have existed on this planet only for the last couple hundred other than ancient Greece but only for the last couple hundred and really only for the last 50 or 60 have we had truly fair free elections where people of all colors all genders uh, various socioeconomic backgrounds can cast their ballot that's precious and worth defending and if I get to spend eight years as the chief elections officer of the state of Ohio I'd go to work excited every day to do that job um, I believe the you have supported some redistricting reform right that Yes. Yes. I, yeah. I, I mean, yeah. No. It's kind of my. It's it's become kind of my thing, or one of my things. When I first got here in 2011, um, it's a fun, funny story actually. You remember the last time we did a state of the state in the state house, right? Sounds it's fly about in the hallways. Well, exactly. And there was a group of us, some of us sort of idealistic new legislators that, that gathered in the back, and we were talking about, isn't it crazy the way we draw district lines? Shouldn't we do something about it? And a couple others overheard us and they joined in and a couple others. And before you knew it, there were like six or eight of us, Republicans and Democrats, a few experienced old hands, uh, folks that have been around for a while and a few newbies like me. And we collectively standing there on the back of the house floor, just shooting the breeze with each other, decided that we should sit down and start figuring out can cats and dogs, oil and water, Republicans and Democrats, can we actually get something done to change the way the district lines are drawn out of that? Uh, Senator Sawyer and I sort of led the effort in the Senate. Uh, Mike Duffy and Mike Stenziano led the effort in the House at that time. And we sat down and came up with a proposal. Um, we introduced it, bipartisan proposal. 
that was the basis, basis that eventually became, years later, issue one that reformed the way state legislative lines are drawn in Ohio. Uh, I pushed that throughout my throughout those years to the point of it annoying my colleagues. And it was kind of like in caucus, who'd be like, I know LaRose redistricting, we hear you, shut up. But that was one of the things that I was really interested in. We got state legislative lines re redone, the process. Uh, what we still have yet to do is reforming the way that we do congressional districts. I've introduced a resolution this year that does that. Um, there's also a citizen's effort underway, as you know. Um, I'm hopeful that one way or another something will get done so that we can have a more balanced process for the way that we draw district lines. It's what's in the best interest of our democracy, and I think ultimately it's what's most healthy for my party, too. Why? Tough love. Uh, and I've said this uh, publicly, that uh, I serve with a lot of good people, and I, I mean that, Republicans and Democrats, but so many of them don't have fall elections, they have spring elections, meaning their focus is on winning primaries. The same dynamic exists at the federal level. A poli-sci student first year can tell you that when Republicans want to win primaries, they go to the right. When Democrats want to win primaries, they go to the left. This is just sort of basic. Gerrymandering, as it's been called, or gerrymandering, as it's properly pronounced, <laughs> I'm a bit of a stickler about that. Elbridge Gary would appreciate it, uh, is not the sole factor, right? But it is a it is a, a large, uh, it, it's a it, it's a chief, one of the chief reasons for dysfunction, I believe. And so, I want to be a member of a party that wins elections because we have better candidates who work harder and have better ideas for governing. I don't think it is sustainable for our party in the long run to win elections by sort of creative drawing of district lines. Um, I think that we will win healthy majorities and continue to govern as the Republican Party because we have more hopeful, opportunity-oriented solutions for the state um, and that we get lazy when we rely on line drawing as a way to earn our victories. Now, the flip side to that is I also don't want to allow an effort to take hold that would turn over the redistricting to some group that would benefit the other side. That's not an improvement. Uh, you know, I think that we need a down the middle process. I think that we've heard proposals that would clearly benefit uh, the other party as well. Uh, that's not what's in the best, best interest of Ohioans. What's in the best interest of Ohioans, I believe, is a process that is balanced, uh, that is uh, bipartisan, that um, um, compels statesmen and women to sit down and compromise on solutions for how these lines should look, not rely on some sort of a formula, uh, which will inevitably be found to be imperfect. Um, and, uh, and so that, that, that's what I've, I'm, I'm pushing for. And I think that we should do it through the legislative referral process, which is a key difference from you know doing it through the, the citizens initiative. I respect the citizens initiative as a way that big change has occurred in this country and in this state in the past, but I think that something like this should be done as a result of the bipartisan collaboration that only happens when you can do multiple hearings in one chamber, pound out the negotiation, multiple hearings in the other chamber, and get it done. That's what, And that's what I hope we can do before the next census, which is 2020. Was it, your res was it the House or Senate resolution on issue one? I can't remember. It ended up being a House resolution. It was a House resolution that put issue one on the ballot. Yeah. But it was identical to what you were pursuing, essentially. In yes, it was. And, 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 and sort of there was this, just like with any issue, it breaks down. There's a, there's everybody's generally interested in it, but there's like a handful of people that are most interested in it, and we work together a lot. And if you remember, uh, I always make the joke that your mom says nothing good happens after midnight, but uh, on uh, at least my mom did. Uh, but in that case, at 4:30 in the morning, something good did happen in the state capitol because that's when we finally, with bags under our eyes and cups of coffee and cold pizza and everything else, we dragged ourselves out onto the Senate floor as a result of this all-night negotiating session, literally walking back and forth down the hall between the room where the Republicans were and the room where the Democrats were and meeting in the middle. And those who uh, uh, enjoyed uh, those kind of things would go outside and have a smoke break together and talk about problems out there. And it, was a, it actually was a remarkable time, something I won't forget, where statesmanship worked, where, where the process of legislating worked and something I was proud to be a part of. And that's why I think that, that the voters clearly um, recognized that and supported this uh, with over 71% of the vote. And there was really no need for an organized effort 
there wasn't like a fundraising effort to go out and tell people vote yes on issue one because it just stood on its own. Editorial boards wrote about it. The uh, um, you know citizen groups uh, came out in support of it, and it and it passed easily. So uh, when you look at the Secretary of State's office today and voting in Ohio today, 